Hey, welcome to the Kingdoms Podcast. My name is Luke and I host this with my buddy Matt Ma. And our goal is to empower you to discover how your faith impacts culture for God's kingdom. To do that, we're sitting down with different men and women from all kinds of disciplines to uncover how they, through their ambitions and vocational skill set, make a difference in the lives of those around them. And so if this is helpful to you, we'd love it if you could like it, share it, and subscribe. In the meantime, enjoy today's episode. Well, hey, everyone. Thank you for being with us today for this episode on the Kingdoms podcast. I'm joined by my co-host, Matt Ma, and we are really grateful to have Pastor Paul Sadler with us. Paul, thank you for making time to be here today. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Friends, if if you know Paul, you know he's got a really rich story. If you don't know Paul, your first impression might be that he's uh, just a fun, kind Canadian in ministry. And uh, while those things are true, uh, there's some really neat elements to his backstory, some places around the world God's taken him to be living on mission, which we're really excited to talk about today, both because of what Paul has learned, but also what we can learn about how to engage with our communities and also with individuals from cross-cultural backgrounds in our local context, whether that's here in Canada or for listeners in the United States there as well, and also different countries around the world. But before we dive into that, Paul, we'd love it if you could give us just a snapshot of how you became a follower of Jesus and what God has called you to do currently in your vocational work. Sure. Yeah, I um, I grew up in, in Scarborough area, didn't go to church, didn't have uh, any real uh, interaction with uh, with the Bible or uh, Christians. And it wasn't until I got to university where I started asking questions. I think I was a guy who was uh, thinking about my future and thinking, uh, I just don't like the kind of person that I am. I had fears about my future. Hmm. I think I also had uh, just a sense of if if this is all there is, and this is a very lonely place to live, and uh, uh, I, I carried those questions with me and uh, uh, met, a, met a, a Christian at a university who actually believed the Bible and related to God the way um, you might, you might uh, relate to a, a close friend or uh, a, a great parent. And uh, it was through that person that I began to ask all my questions and uh, really argued with them for about a year. And uh, finally, after dealing with uh, those uh, those questions, that uh, I eventually put my faith in Christ, and uh, Jesus took me on an adventure. And now I'm uh, I'm serving as a pastor in Richmond Hill. Yeah, that's so good. Now, you mentioned that you had this friend who came alongside you and sort of like in this really missional way started to share Jesus with you as you asked questions. Uh, as a young adult in the 90s, how did you seek to represent Christ and impact the lives of others in your workplace and in your neighborhood? Yeah, so I, I guess having asked so many questions and been really um uh, something of a of an, an annoying person with all of the skeptical arguments, and I, I guess I just have a uh, a sense of compassion and understanding for people who who for whom the Bible you they don't take it uh, mm. uh, at face value. They've got questions. They they struggle with things, and so I, I think I always gravitated towards wanting to try to to help people that uh, were in the in the position that I was so uh, we did a we did a ton of things uh, a lot had a lot of people um, uh, neighbors co-workers friends over for dinner and uh, just tried to um, share about what was going on in my life and uh, uh, how just Jesus was a natural part of that and and sometimes that led to conversation sometimes it didn't but uh, trying to take a, take advantage of those opportunities to share about him uh, there were um, there were a few of us in our church that just said um, let's start something let's do something to um, to 
not only make the gospel known, but give an up kind of a, a safe place for people to ask questions. And so mm. uh, we just, we didn't really know what we were doing, but we started a, an investigative Bible study. We just looked at simple gospel um, passages from the Bible. Um, we took turns leading that and asking questions and, and just doing a discussion, but without, uh, without the church being the agenda, we were just making it about Jesus and, uh, and, and really making that our, a home and a place for our non-Christian friends to, uh, to connect with us. Then I guess at, at work, I felt that every day, so I, I would make a point of eating in our lunchroom, and it felt like every day there were all of these questions, and uh, people from all different backgrounds would just get into it with uh, uh, discussion about things. And, and so where there was an opportunity, I would dive in with those, um, maybe with a question, maybe with a, a comment. Um, just tried to raise the flag of my faith and um, perspective and coming at things. But I also tried to listen. And this is probably true of anyone, but you can't help but, but listen to people in a workplace setting and hear that there are people with needs. And mm. remember this one gentleman, he would frequently talk about the problems and struggles in his life. And Eventually, I, I just asked him, I said, would you, would you be interested in talking about some of those things and hearing what, what the Bible has to say about them? Mm -hmm. And so we ended up um, uh, once, probably once every two weeks, instead of eating in the lunchroom, we found another place where just the two of us could, could have our lunch together. And he would talk about something he was dealing with, and I would try to open the Bible and, and uh, share how the Bible was relating to some of the issues he was going through. And uh, he felt deeply helped and encouraged by that. And I, I just felt here's an opportunity to make the, the Bible and the scriptures real to this person. Yeah. yeah. Then from there, I, I can't remember exactly what, what went from there to uh, uh, the next step, but at a certain point, I just thought, I've developed really good relationships with these people. I care about them. I think that there's an opportunity to do something here. I had a great relationship with the president of the company who was uh, not a Christian. He, he, he wasn't uh, on the same page in, in terms of all of my beliefs, but just a, a, a really thoughtful understanding um, open uh, man. And, and so I just asked uh, at, at a certain point, do you think I could use the boardroom after, you know, once, once the shift is over, once five o'clock comes, could I use the boardroom for um, a Bible study for, for any of the, any of the workers here that are interested in, in getting together? And so um, he said, yes, I took that opportunity and uh, just did a simple series. I think we just did it once a month. Who is Jesus and what does it matter? And again, just looked at simple passages from the, from, uh, the Gospels that would speak to who Christ was and, and, uh, and, and just did it in a discussion format with uh, 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 giving coworkers an opportunity to hear the Gospel giving Christian co-workers an opportunity to have fellowship and talk about spiritual things with people yeah. at work, which I think for most of them was novel and interesting and, and, uh, uh, and had a co-worker put their faith in Christ, you know, as a part of those studies. And just you know, for me, it was just a, a, a beautiful ministry um, opportunity that uh, I, I just felt, um, hey, if, if I just keep doing, doing this for, for, for good, I'd be, I'd be really happy and satisfied. Wow. Man, those are, those are some great examples. I feel like for so many people listening who are asking that question, how can I make a difference in my community, my neighborhood, especially in my workplace? Those are some, some sweet examples of God using your life and your availability, really. 
uh, to make a difference and to invite people to, as you said, consider who is Jesus and, and why it matters. And I'm, I'm intrigued to know, and, and maybe you could delve into this a little deeper, you know, as you're seeking to live on mission in Canada in the 90s, uh, I'm sure there were some really formative experiences. Maybe, maybe that that would tie into what you just shared about the, you know, using that space in the boardroom to to have that study. But I just wonder, you know, were there moments where you're like, wow, I didn't realize it, but this works really well. And on the flip side, maybe were there any moments where you're like, wow, this does not work. This is not a great strategy for engaging people. Uh, the experiences along those lines that really shaped your understanding of how to impact the lives of those around you, your immediate culture for Christ. Yeah, I think the basics, so the specifics are, are going to be different wherever you go and whatever setting you're in, but I think the basics translate and to start with just showing up and investing time in people. It, it mm. can't be, you can't just be trying to, to uh, sell Christianity as, as kind of a um, wrongly motivated and without a care for the, the the person. I think I think people can sell can tell if you are trying to sell them something. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to genuinely caring for people and believing that Jesus has answers to the problems that we all have, and um, so uh, so I spent lots of time with people. I listened to people. Um, I, sh you know, if the co if, if my coworkers are, are eating in the lunchroom, I, I'm, I'm there with them. Uh, I'm talking with them, I invite them out to, you know, whether it was concerts or coffee or, you know, I just, I cared for my coworkers imperfectly, but, but I just feel before you're going to start talking about what you believe, you, you need to listen to people. Uh, you need to develop relationships and and make them know that you genuinely care for them. Mm -hmm. Then I think some people don't get that right, and and they're just really bold, and and they're gonna they're gonna give the message. Other people they really care about people, but they don't have the boldness to to actually say anything to them, yeah. and. Maybe today people would look back and say, oh, yeah, in the 90s, uh, doing Bible studies in the boardroom, that was probably, you know, a simple thing. And, and like, for me, I, I thought it was, I, I thought this is probably going to be impossible. Like, nobody, it wasn't like I'd seen people doing this, and, and I thought that uh, um, there would be a great openness for it. But I would just say, try things be bold don't don't be afraid that the door would be closed like so you ask and they say no what what could be what's to be lost in that yeah and so i just feel i think there are lots of opportunities that we have before us but we we overthink it and say oh they'll probably say no or this is probably a bad idea mm -hmm. and i would just say walk through the door um, ask people, um, be okay. If they say, no, it's all right. And, uh, you have, you have no idea what, what God might uh, open up for you. Yeah. Be ambitious for the kingdom of God. I like that. I like that. Yeah, that's great. And as you, uh, just mentioned, like how many opportunities there are, uh, I think sometimes for, uh, young adults or, or teenagers as they're growing up and trying to like look towards what they might do with their life, the opportunities abound and the ways to serve God in those opportunities abound. Uh, for yourself, like this desire to be missional really became uh, something that took you out of Canada. How did you discern the call to go to Japan? And maybe you can even tell us a bit about your, your focus once you were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I need to say that the, that my first step towards Japan started even before I became a Christian. Hmm. And wow. so I was a, I was a mechanical engineering student. I was, I was thinking about my career, my success, my whatever. Hmm. And so as a student, I was, I was looking into an internship 
uh, in Japan after I graduated. I'd applied to one after my second year, was turned down, got a job in Finland, and, and uh, enjoyed that, but said, when I graduate, I want go to go to Japan. Between that decision and graduation, I became uh, a follower of Jesus, and uh, all kinds of changes were happening in my life. But in Japan, um, there were all kinds of changes happening there as well. They were hit with the recession. Um, they say that the bubble economy burst. Yeah. And uh, it was a time in the, the nation's uh, um, history where everything economically that had been assumed since post-war just fell apart. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up, all of the internships that I was looking at for engineers were, were um, canceled because of this recession. I ended up turning around in church one day, greeting my neighbor. I say, hey, what are you doing for the summer? He says, I'm going to Japan. I'm like, that's crazy. I, I've been planning to go to Japan, but all of my, my plans have fallen through. And uh, uh, he said, well, you should contact my dad. Maybe he has, uh, has some ideas and some contacts for you. Well, it turned out it was the uh, son of a fellowship uh, international missionary that was serving uh, on the north coast of Japan. Wow. I ended up connecting there, um, went and uh, uh, ended up serving in that church while that family was home back in Canada. And uh, for me, it was life-changing in, in many ways, but the, the biggest one was I had always looked at Japan as the nation of achievers. Mm. If you are disciplined enough and you study enough and you sacrifice enough, you'll be successful, happy, fulfilled. And, and that was the dream for me. That was my gospel, that mm. that's, that's the way you do it. And I arrived in the country just as the economy had fallen apart and people who had sacrificed everything for their company and their career now found themselves uh, laid off, uh, found themselves in a, uh, a company that was no longer going anywhere, didn't know whether the company would be around and asking themselves the question, why, why did we do all this? What's it all for? And, and I was looking on the outside in thinking, I thought you guys had all the answers. I thought, I thought that success would mean, you know, the, the sense of satisfaction and meaning. And, and I guess as I saw a nation coming to terms with that, it was helping me to come to terms with that. And the most hopeful thing I saw in 10 months um, in rural Japan was this tiny little church of a couple dozen um, couple dozen people and they had problems and struggles and it wasn't flashy it was just a little family um, family of believers and yet they were hopeful they had their lives were directed by different values they had they had a sense of purpose and joy that I just didn't see elsewhere. And it was really in seeing that that I, 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 I had a love for Jesus before I went to Japan. Seeing that, I, I, I just developed this love for the church mm. and the power of a community of believers to really bring incredible transformation. And as I was coming to terms with that, it was also with an understanding there are millions and millions of people in Japan who don't have access to a church, who won't hear the good news of, uh, of Jesus Christ, because there just aren't enough of those little families of God, uh, little um, communities of believers making him known in that country. Mm -hmm. And so it was really in wrestling with those things and 
and, and feeling a sense of burden that I began to say, um, I'd, I'd moved from a, a point of saying, God, I'm, in, I'm here for this 10 months and I'm, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do during this time. But when I'm done, I'm getting back to my career and heading back to Canada and please don't make anything else a part of this equation. To the point, so I was, I came from that and over the course of that 10 months, God completely changed my heart where I was then asking if there was any way that I could be used of you to help establish churches in, in Japan, that would be such a privilege. And I just began asking God to, uh, to let me be a part of it, whatever it was. Yeah. So then I, I, I headed back to Canada at the end of that 10 months, spent seven years in preparation, and eventually um, wow. headed back in 2000 with um, my wife, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, uh, and um, uh, ready to give ourselves to uh, um, looking to, to plant a church in, uh, wow. in Japan. Yeah. Man, I so appreciate what you said in terms of wanting to be ready to give myself to whatever you know God would have you do in that context. And it's amazing how often you read uh, biographies of different uh, spiritual figures throughout history. Uh, spiritual leaders, men and women, who, who in some form or another reach that point of just one, the joy of being exposed to or a part of the transforming kingdom work that God is doing in the world mm -hmm. and, and reaching this point of realization of saying, Lord, whatever it is, if, if I can just be a part of this, if I can be a part of seeing your church established and seeing yeah. lives changed and seeing the kingdom of God expand, like I'll do, I'll wash dishes. I'll like, you know, I'll, like, I'll do anything. Yeah. I just want to be a part of that. So it's beautiful to hear how over that that 10 months uh, in Japan, your heart was really on a journey of, of change and, and God moving in you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you mentioned a second ago, just that you, uh, with your wife, with a three-year-old and a two-year-old in 2000, traveled to Japan to start serving there as long-term missionaries. And for anyone who's traveled internationally, you know, we have moments of recognizing things like culture shock and big difference that may exist between different countries or even continents in the world versus what is experienced, you know, in our home country or home continent, which for many listeners is, is the West. So for you and, and for your family, you're traveling to Japan, you're wanting to have a gospel impact, but there's so much to learn. So what was it like for you to, to study, to, to really understand and embrace Japanese culture and the Japanese people? Mm. Yeah, big question. Um, I, I, I think I would first need to say uh, so I love to study, and the two thing, two things that fascinate me are the way people think and the words they use to express themselves. Mm. So, so studying the Japanese language. Uh, if you don't know any language, I maybe maybe personality enters into this, but I would far rather study. Japanese than I would ever study English and it, it's it's a beautiful orderly it, it is in one sense it's the perfect language because there are no exceptions you know 10 times as many grammar rules as English but they never break the rules uh, mm. so so the Japanese language I I I absolutely adore and uh, I love the writing system that that uh, they inherited from China um so all of that was, was a pleasure. Um, and, and, and so there's two things. You're, you're learning how to communicate, but obviously you're also learning how to relate. How do you do relationship? And I, I was prepared for the one. I wasn't so much prepared for the other. You, you know that you have to learn a different language. Mm. But you, I think I, I assumed that the basic rules of making friendships were pretty much universal. And uh, maybe those translate in some different cultures, but uh, I, I really had to start over again in, in building relationships and learning how Japanese um, people build relationships. Um, maybe, you know, a couple simple examples. One, when I first moved to Japan, I would, I would, 
greet my neighbors in the morning. And I would carry the garbage. They, they had garbage days and it was a communal garbage area. I'd carry my, my garbage out and greet my neighbors. And I knew that I wasn't fluent in the language, but I, I, the good morning, I, I knew that I had, I wasn't butchering that at least, but nobody was greeting me. And then about two or three weeks into my stay, the host said to me, oh, we forgot to do greetings. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, when you move to a new area in Japan, you're supposed to, if, you're, if it's a house, you, you visit the neighbors on the left and the right mm. and across from you. We forgot to do that. And so he took me to a store and I bought some very simple, very simple practical gifts um, maybe it was a towel, a little hand towel that I got for each of the neighbors. Anyway, I, I took that. It was about six o'clock, seven o'clock at night, um, visited, gave those three neighbors a little gift, told them who I was, what my intentions were. Um, and you have this phrase that means um, I'm, I'm probably going to be a, a big nuisance to you, but please uh, be good to me anyway. And I said that, and we went back, and I didn't really think very much of it. The very next morning, every neighbor I met, not just those three neighbors, every single neighbor I met greeted me warmly. Mm. And, I, I, and I, to this day, I don't know what happened. I don't know whether those neighbors called around and said, okay, it's, it's all right to greet the foreigner now, mm. but but there is a way to do relationship mm. and there are rules to be followed. And the cues that we normally um, think of are, are you, you need to be a student of how people do relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in an honor shame culture, like to show honor in that way, even just with a simple gift, I'm sure went, right. uh, went really far. So there are many differences. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm interested to hear about is maybe how your understanding of Japanese culture actually um, maybe helped you read scripture better or in a different way. And uh, with that, could you explain what the samurai gospel is? Yeah, right. Yeah, so as I began to understand, okay, this is how Japanese do relationships. This is how... Uh, this is how I can communicate in this language. Then I be then I needed to figure out how do Japanese think. And so as I would, I would provide ex explanations of uh, the, the the Bible, the gospel, the the Christian life. As I pre presented explanations that were very meaningful to me and very helpful to me in coming to Christ. I would usually be met with blank stares um, and very little, very little response. I felt mm. like I was a tennis player and I kept lobbing the ball over and it just never came back. And so you can't experience that without you go searching, you go try to, you, you scratch your head. And as I did that, I began to read the Bible in light of Japanese culture. Hmm. What is it that there are things in my culture that make certain truths about Christianity easy to understand? And I began to look for truths about Japanese culture that it will make it easier for them to understand. Yeah. And so I would just say there were, there were many lines of uh, lines to the cross that I learned natural to me, unnatural to Japanese, uh, but conversely, um, natural to Japanese and unnatural to most Canadians. So the, the samurai gospel is, is uh, maybe that's an overstate, maybe, maybe I, I, I exaggerate the uh, significance of this, but I would often talk with, with Japanese about the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. Mm. And as I look at that account, he, for me, is, he's a, he's a Roman jailer, but he's all samurai in my mind. And he, he's 
a, a military man. He's a tough man. He, he is a man who has, um, has come and, and experienced uh, the, the, the challenges and difficulties of war and then uh, life in, in, in running a jail. And he has earned his status um, mm -hmm. through that process. He's come to be, to be honored and respected by um, people in, in his day. Along come Paul and Silas, and they have been deemed to be unworthy. They're, the things that come out of their mouth, the, their teachings, are so unacceptable that they're thrown into jail. And it says they were thrown into the inner prison, and then they're put in stocks. There's nothing more humiliating um, than to be um, thrown in prison and to be treated like uh, an animal. And yet when they are put to the very lowest of humiliation and embarrassment, the scripture records that they were singing songs of praise to God and exhibiting a joy that was wholly unnatural. Then what happens is there's an earthquake and all of the doors in the prison fly open and the jailer realizes what's happened and he is about to kill himself. And I think it's hard, it would have been hard for me as a Canadian to, to think like, you've had a bad day at work, man, what on earth are you gonna kill yourself for? But hmm. the Japanese understand suicide probably as well as anyone in the world. Yeah. Uh, the idea that if I have dishonored my position and my status and my family, I have to pay the price with my own life. I, it, it's better for me to pay the to pay the penalty and take the punishment than to to be in a in a situation where I am uh, I am I'm having to be dragged in front of the courts by someone else and and punished for for my wrongs. Just at that moment, Paul and Silas interrupt, stop him from what he's doing, reassure him that they're not going anywhere. But in so doing, they, they stun him because here is this elite rabbi who has been trained in, in, the, in has the best education. Uh, he's a Roman citizen. He has status and he's lost everything. He had joy. And when he's given the opportunity to run away from it, he stands and cares about this man. And in, in the face of that, he realizes that while it looked like these prisoners who have lost all of this world's honor uh, have, uh, have been humiliated, they have an honor uh, from God that, that allows them to see life in, in a different way and walk with a confidence that is unnatural given their cir circumstances. And so he asks them, what do I need to do to be saved? Yeah. That it's, it, it is in this savior that they have found um, an honor that, that the world doesn't know about and an honor that can overcome this world's shame, that you can be beaten to the curb have, have, have been completely humiliated by life circumstances and yet have joy, confidence, purpose, and meaning because you've received a, a, an, an honor that is, that is beyond that in, in being, becoming a child of God. And yeah. the, the jailer, my samurai, he responds and does so, uh, does so joyfully and, and, uh, the, his, his entire household is transformed. Yeah. So, and that's a, may, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I, maybe just one other example, if I could. Um, yeah, please. The last place that you would expect to find hope for uh, communicating the gospel has got to be the book of Leviticus. Mm. And it was in Japan that I, I first when I began to study Japanese culture, studied it in conjunction with the Bible, I realized 
I have to preach through Leviticus. Um, didn't, didn't go all the way through it, but I realized that words like sin, uh, the, the Japanese word for sin means crime. Mm. And, and so when you, so if you present the gospel and they say, well, we're, we're all sinners and, and the, the average super upstanding, incredibly diligent, conscientious, courteous Japanese person would say, what are you talking about? I'm not a mm. criminal. Yeah. So they don't, that concept always creates struggles and problems. But they know purity and impurity and cleanness and uncleanness better than most people in the world. Mm. You go into a Japanese home and uh, it, it is often immaculate. Um, when you get to the door, they have a little ledge and every Japanese home has got one, but the ledge is to signify up until here is dirty. On the other side of this ledge is clean and mm. nothing from the dirty transfers into the clean. And so you take off your shoes and, you, and your, your host will provide some slippers for you and they cover your feet, which, uh, it, they have the same ledge when you go into the washroom. The, 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 there's another ledge and you leave your outside slip, your, your slippers for the rest of the home in one place, another ledge to say, okay, we're going into another zone now. This place is dirty. And yes, you get into now your toilet slippers. And just about every Japanese get, uh, or foreigner who visits Japan has been in the uncomfortable position you're in the living room, you're talking with your Japanese friends and you look down at your feet and you realize I'm wearing the toilet slippers. They're usually bright pink. They say WC on them, maybe like humiliating, right? Mm. Anyway, you read that in connection with Leviticus and the, the, the understanding that, that we are impure, and there is a savior who cleanses us. And it, 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 it just another road to the cross. Mm. So I would talk to them, for instance, about, um, you know, most, most, most of my guests, um, if they were foreigners, they would talk about how frustrating it was to always have to take off their shoes and put on these slippers. And, and, and when they, even if they were willing to take them off, the idea that there it had to be at this line and and they would complain about that and uh, and I would talk to my Japanese host. I said, "Well, what what would you do? My can my Canadian guest doesn't think their feet are all that dirty," and they would say, "Doesn't matter. You may not see the dirt. I know it's there. And if you come into my house with your dirty feet, it's going to ruin it." And, and then I would press them on that, by, but I said, they're cultured, you know, that's just the way they do things. And they would say, yeah, but I'm the host, this is my home. And if they wanna come in, they need to take off their shoes. Just cleaning them off at the mat doesn't do it. And, and then I would say, that, that's a little bit like what heaven and God's presence is like. We often can look at our lives and we think, We've cleaned ourselves up enough that we're clean enough for God's presence, clean enough for heaven. And, and yet uh, there isn't anything we can do to fully cleanse ourselves. And so through the cross, Jesus provided a covering for us, slippers for heaven, if you like, that we can, if we can, can admit our uncleanness, and accept uh, what Jesus has done for us, giving ourselves to him, he, he, he will receive us as the perfect um, host of heaven, and, um, and, and you, you can enter into that relationship with him. So there was these, these little lines to the gospel as I saw Japanese culture mm -hmm. and uh, the scriptures teachings. Those are, those are, well, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. 
those are excellent examples of how careful study and understanding and appreciation of someone's culture not only informs the way you read scripture, but helps you to then communicate scripture in a way that points people to the gospel. So thank you for sharing that. I, I learned a ton just in, in both those examples about engaging with Japanese men and women surrounding the gospel. So thank you for sharing those, Paul. And I wonder, that's a, a really great segue. I mean, we've had the chance to to talk together a, a bit about your life as an engineer in Canada in the 90s, obviously your work then in Japan and the process of wanting to understand that culture so you could invite people to know Jesus. Uh, but now obviously you're based in in Ontario, Canada. You're, you're serving as a pastor at a church uh, in your passport country. And what's sweet in my mind is that you know, you've had this wealth of experience over a decade and a half in Japan to, to learn, hey, what does it look like for me to be attentive to and to respond to and to engage with uh, someone in a cross-cultural setting, if you will, who maybe mm. sees life and culture and conduct and morals through a very different lens. And I really believe in this season in our lives, it's the providence of God that we have so many men and women from around the world coming to our doorsteps uh, here here in, in Canada, also in the United States, in different historically Christian countries around the world. And so with that, I, it's so crucial for followers of Jesus to be saying, how can I build relationships that understand, respect these people's culture, and invite them to know Jesus? So I, I wonder, in light of your cross-cultural ministry experiences, specifically in Japan, uh, could you share with us some of your best insights on how Jesus followers in Canada or other historically Christian countries who are receiving uh, so many men and women from around the world, how we can be people who welcome them, how we can be people who build real relationships, and also how we can be people who share Christ with, with immigrants to Canada. Those are, those are all great, great questions. And I, I, think that, I think the biggest thing that I learned in Japan is how hard it is to be an immigrant. Mm. Uh, to... I can't believe that I'm the only person that experienced this and that it was unique for to be a Canadian going to Japan. I think you uproot and leave everything and try to start life in a new country. I think we just need to remember, first of all, just how hard it is. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's lonely. Mm. You, you, there's so much that you, so many of your relationships that you miss, your friendships that you miss, often family that you miss. So just to remember how, how lonely it is to be an immigrant. Um, then to remember how hard it is to be an immigrant. You're starting life over. Uh, often you have great qualifications in the country that you came. You'd figured out how to do life in one country. Now you show up in a new country and you're starting from scratch and you don't have the instincts and the connections and, and, and often the credentials to, to do the kinds of things that you want to do. And, and it's, it's, it's just hard. Yeah. Um, and, and then when it comes to language and culture, I knew uh, even when you're able to pass yourself off as an in insider linguistically or otherwise, you know how far you sh how far short you fall. Mm -hmm. You feel your inadequacies, and I think that's part of the immigrant experience. That uh, uh, loneliness, difficulty, a sense of you feel your inadequacy, and if you knew anyone in your neighborhood and you knew for certain they were lonely going through a difficult time and feeling inadequate and therefore uh, a little you know, overwhelmed by something, you would, you would run over there and look to help them. Hmm. And yet I think, that, I think that can be assumed of most immigrants that you uh, that you meet at, at work, that you run into in, in your neighborhood. Um, I, I think we just, we need to assume some of these needs are there. Mm. And um, if you know that there are needs there, to, to look for ways that you can meet them. Yeah. So just, just being a friend, uh, mm. just 
offering kindness, just opening your door, looking for ways to uh, to support and encourage and and be um, a practical help. When I was in Japan, I had people uh, coming. You know, have you figured out? Have you figured out how to do how how our banking system works? You know, like have you have you set up at a at a now that was that was when I first arrived, but but after that, I had people from church and from our neighbors. They they would help me through every step of uh, of that process, and and I would just I would just think to myself, I wonder what what stage of adjustment uh, this neighbor of mine is or this coworker of mine is and what their needs might be. Then I would say the second thing would be, I think most cultures and most places where immigrants are coming from are more relational, more community oriented than Canada is. Mm. I'm not saying this is the loneliest place on earth and we're, you know, but, but we're a little cold, right? Mm. And, and so because of that, uh, it can, for many, the culture shock in coming to Canada is, boy, these Canadians are not very warm and friendly and, uh, and it's difficult to get to know them. And, and if you can do what most cultures around the world do, which is see food not as something to just provide you with the right number of nutrients and proteins to make it through the day, but to see food as a vehicle for relationship, yeah. then it doesn't matter whether you understand their culture, their language, or or even whether you've you've got a Bible degree and can answer all of their questions, food, if you are able to share it with uh, with an immigrant and someone who's new to the country, will speak volumes to them and be uh, a, a, the means of what it is. I think in most other cultures, it's a means of of relationship. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So there's so many opportunities out there and uh, we've kind of already talked about how the nations have really come to our doorstep. Um, but as a pastor who's here in Canada and uh, really motivating your church as you lead them, uh, what are some real uh, opportunities, primary ways that you see the church is positioned well to uh, really impact Canada for the sake of Christ? Yeah, so I, I I think I would start by saying that as you look at how divided our world is today, as you look at how lonely and disconnected our world has has become today, hmm. and as you look at the sense in which so many people today are feeling uh, driven, worn out. A lot of people during the pandemic have been saying, I've been doing this job for what it pays me, but I, it's not enough anymore. I want to do something that has meaning and purpose. And I believe on all of those fronts that the church is uniquely positioned. Um, I believe that we can show a new and different kind of community where we are not uniting around uh, our politics or our perspectives, our ethnicity or uh, any other allegiance, but we're, we're united around Christ with incredible diversity, a celebration of our differentness, but um, doing so around the, the center of the gospel and and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Hmm. So I think that the, the church is uniquely positioned to be uh, a force for unity and to, to show uh, a different uh, vision of unity. Hmm. Um, I, th I think similarly, uh, we are the family of God. We are, we are the household of faith and 
we are called to relationship with one another. Fellowship, fellowship as it was originally envisioned in, in, in the early church was a powerful dynamic uh, whereby the, the way that people invested in each other's lives and, in, and in, in community with one another made people stop and notice. Uh, in Acts chapter two, it says, and they, they had favor with all the people because yeah. they saw the fellowship, the relationship, uh, the, the depth of community that they enjoyed. And again, I don't think that's something that comes naturally to us in Canada. And yet the church is uniquely positioned to, to be one of the warmest places in the country and to do so through the power of our fellowship. Mm. And, and then just thirdly, we believe that even the most mundane tasks takes on meaning, not because of how much status it gives you, not because of how much money it gives you, because if you begin a relationship with, with, with God through faith in Jesus Christ, and you understand how he has created you, and understand that the, the opportunities that he has given you for serving and working are actually they're assigned to you by your creator, and they are an invitation to participate with him in what he's doing to bless this world and to make uh, our world a better place. When you understand that and you embrace that by faith, life becomes a, a powerful uh, and meaningful thing that, that you can give yourself to um, in a way that you couldn't if it was just about the paycheck. Yeah. Man, so well said, and a great, a great place for us to, to wrap things up in our conversation together. Uh, Paul, this has been really intriguing for me, encouraging, inspiring, and yeah, I've learned a lot of really practical things along the way. And for people who are listening in and have just kind of had a snapshot of who you are and, and what you're doing, we'd love for them to be able to connect more, to learn more about the ministry you're a part of or other ways they can engage with uh, your insights or teaching or writing uh, on various elements of life as followers of Jesus. So uh, if people want to learn more about you, what you're a part of, how can they get connected? Sure. Yeah, probably the, the place to start would be just gracebc.ca. Um, I blog uh, weekly there. Um, I have a blog called Out of Neutral. Um, also, a uh, you can our YouTube channel uh, has our, my weekly blog, as well as my messages, uh, Grace Baptist Church of Richmond Hill on YouTube. Uh, and then um, Out of Neutral is also a podcast. So uh, with, with Out of Neutral, what I'm trying to do, um, five, six minutes um, once a week where I'm dealing with uh, some of the ways that we can uh, move beyond life as uh, life is a chore, get out of neutral and get into a life that is engaged, full, meaningful, and uh, bringing, bringing those answers from scripture each week. Yeah. That's great. Man, that's awesome. Well, Paul, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for everything you've shared. And yeah, thank you for the good kingdom work you're doing in the world. We're grateful for you and grateful for this time. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Matt. It's been a pleasure being a part of it.